Uh, this message is maybe just the beginning, because I don't want to go more in depth to this. And it's not as refined as much as I would like it, but it'll at least be something for you to chew on for this next week. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would, would, would you walk with Him within the narrow roads? Would you have a very brief care of the Lord? Let Him have His way with thee. Would you have Him make you free and follow in His call? Would you in His kingdom find a place of constant rest? Would you prove Him true and providential tests? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with you. Um, I, this week I was reading the, the first part where you have the articles of uh, an older Bible Methodist where they were talking about holiness. Some of you may have a copy of that. Oh, maybe you've read it. I thought it very interesting I think, you know, uh, people ask, what kind of church are you? They say, well, we're holiness. Well, you've probably got dozens of definitions of holiness uh, floating around up there. To some people, holiness, a holiness church is something to be glad about, and others is to run from because of the picture they have in their mind of what it is. And um, those that are deep in the holiness movement, they claim it as their badge. This is who we are, and it's a good thing. And I have no problem with that. <clears throat> but there, I do question maybe the particular distinction of holiness that they are thinking about when they think of holiness. And as I've been around the holiness churches, they can mean a number of different things. And they all call themselves holiness. Karen and I uh, have spent most of our years connected with Reverend Helms ministry. It would be called the holiness ministry, but there are there are parts of it that we felt like the world and some ideas had kind of taken root and, and it lessened the impact of the holiness. The Reverend Helen himself would be very near what I believe holiness should be. I respect him very highly in the Schultzes as well. There's some in there that I still respect very highly. I'll just throw out one example. Uh, I'm not careful over time. You, you kind of, somebody says, well, this is not that bad. And it's really not that bad. But because it's really not that bad, and they choose to make that little step in that direction, then somebody else comes along and says, well, this is not far off of that. It's not really that bad. And so we'll, we'll make another little incremental step over here, and before long, you move the way. And you're doing things that you wouldn't have thought about doing 10, 15 years before. And your, your grandparents who were started that church or whatever, that movement, they would think you're far off in the world. So they get a really good idea of what holiness is all about. What does it mean to be a holiness church, a holiness movement, a holiness people? And my, a lot of I'm going to share right here and found in these verses and some others. We need to understand what holiness is so we can understand what it is we're called to. Where does it come from? And so um, there were, those were good articles, but I found that what the Lord has been showing me, and, and uh, it'll show up later, is that um, holiness is found more perfect in relationship. In fact, if we're not in relationship, number one, with God and with one another through the power of Christ, 
it's possible that we may not be able to be really homeless people. We may not be able to accomplish that. Holiness. We we'll look here, let's start here with this. Isaiah 6, 1 through 3. In the year the king Uzziah died, I also I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up in his train filled the temple. That in itself would have been quite a revelation for Isaiah. Wow, he's looking up there in heaven and sees this great, uh, beautiful throne. He's looking into heaven. He sees the Lord sitting upon the throne and his train filled the temple. As explained it before, the glory, the wonder of this, the train is is that robe, it's the part of the robe, kind of a cape that just lays out behind us the kings. If you've ever seen some of the, the the real kings and queens in say some of the European countries and things like that, they would have this this uh, train behind them. it's this long cape, it's usually a red velvet has gold inlaid in it, probably gold threads. And it's beautiful, and it's just, and it, it represents, represents the, the kingdom and the authority and the sovereignty of the king or queen who has it draped from his or her shoulders. Above us stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. And that was probably a unique experience for, uh, for Isaiah type of angel, six wings. He's seen birds with two wings. He hasn't maybe he's seen a dragonfly if there's some over in the Middle East. He has four wings. He got six wings. With twain he covers his face. And with twain he covers his feet. And with twain he can fly. And one cried unto another of the seraphim and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Cherubim, 
called four beasts. So maybe they're more like beasts than they are angels, but they have six wings. They rest. Before we hear him saying, holy, 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 and the foundations are shaken. But here it says, they rest not day and night. If there's day and night in heaven, at least for, it helps us to understand what it means. Continually. Let's shout out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Is holy. Be you holy, for the Lord spoke to Israel and said, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Be you holy. It was proclaimed to the whole nation of Israel after God had delivered them from Egypt. He had brought them out of the place of sin, out of the place of, of suffering and oppression. And when we are in sin, we are in a place of oppression and suffering. Because we end up coming under the control of other people or ideas. And, we, and that's the oppression. Only as we're free in Christ are we free from the oppression of the world around us and the, the the pressures that are put upon us by our peers, and by society, and by culture. We're oppressed people. We're sinful people. Because we're not living righteously. We're not living true to His Word, to His character. And so we're sinning. So we, at the very beginning, as He's calling the people out, you're going to be my people. I'm delivering you. I'm saving you. And I want you to be holy because I am holy. I am your Lord. The priests were further instructed to be holy, and the high priest was to wear a head bonnet with the phrase written on it, holiness, with a little plate there, holiness unto the Lord, written on his, his forehead. The priestly office could not be uh, performed by unholy men and still receive the blessing of God. They had to approach God in holiness. And it was written on the, the forehead of that bonnet. <coughs> holiness unto the Lord that is the one great requirement of God if we're going to come and fellowship with God and have a relationship with God there has to be holiness brought back into Him of course we're not able to do that ourselves in the New Testament Peter declares but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, in all manner of your life, every aspect of your life. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So we don't lose anything in the New Testament. We don't have special freedoms. This is good, because you're going to hear people say, well, we have liberty in Christ. No, we don't. The only liberty we have in Christ is liberty from that oppression and that sin that has bound us. That's where the liberty comes from. We're bound by Satan. We're bound by ourselves. By sin. We're bound by the world. The only liberty we have is getting free from that bondage and that oppression. We don't have the liberty to do whatever we want. We still have to approach God in holiness and purity. And that's why we need a deep work in our lives. Something has got to change in us. And God Himself was relating to the Israelites there in Leviticus. Be holy. I said this before you. If you want to be my people, there's going to be great blessings that's part of the covenant. Great blessings to be part of God's people. He's going to take care of us. And He proved it over and over again in the wilderness. But if you want to be my people, you're going to have to be holy. You're going to have, there's no way you can approach me in your unholiness. What happened to Eli's two sons? Or, no, it, was, it wasn't Eli's two sons. Well, that was bad too. But it was one of the other priests. And I don't know if it was uh, maybe Eli's, two of his sons, that brought strange fire, something other than what God wanted, brought it to the tabernacle. Brought it to the tabernacle. And God immediately struck him dead. We cannot approach God. It's something other than his character. So something has got to change. And, and if you will look at, if you were to go through the law, the next time you read through the Old Testament, understand the reason why God was giving that law, the commandments, the statutes, the testimonies, 
was so that they could be transformed and be able to approach God. That God made provision for a certain family, the Levites, to be able to approach Him. That they had to be sanctified. They had to be pure before they came for Him. They had their sins atoned for. And they wore holy garments, a uniform, so to speak. And they had to be cleansed with blood. Be sprinkled on them in the garbage. And how can that cleanse? Well, that's part of God's plan. Life is in the blood. And it will be through blood that there will be a cleansing and a deliverance. Be separate and come out. Paul says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You're going to get a picture here of this holiness, the call to holiness. <coughs> the call to move away from the world around us and move toward the very nature of God. Be not equally yoked together with unbelievers. So there's, you're a believer. Don't be with unbelievers. Don't yoke with them. For what fellowship has the righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? Or wickedness? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? We are the temple of God. For you, the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You see the separation there. And we're to be a holy temple. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Touch not. This is why we shouldn't be thinking about evil things, as we discussed earlier. Don't set your mind on those things. Horror movies are not a good thing to watch. Set things in your mind, your memory, that you're going to have to kick out later. Those things that I watched as a teenager, preteen, and I wish I'd never watched them. Every once in a while they come back to haunt me. Watching the movie screen. You know, they say, this is not real, this is not real. You know, well, it becomes real to us because it's long the way in our brains. That's not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. You see this, you're, you're crossing this, this territory to go from the world to a place that's pure, God's kingdom. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now ponder that. This is not just speaking about a physical separation from the world. It's mainly speaking of no longer being like them. The world and the worldliness would now be like God. The Apostle John has given this very basic but clear picture of what the world is. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, covetousness. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if we love anything other than Christ himself in the sense of the fullest sense of love, devotion, consecration, or as Jesus said, if we're loving people or things more than we love God, we're in idolatry. We've got to love him up. all, completely. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not in the Father, but is in the world. Lust, envy, greed, desire, covetousness. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life that it happened immediately in the garden. That Adam and Eve were humble souls until they rebelled against God, and immediately their heart was turned back toward themselves, curved inward. And now they became their own gods, they became their own lords and masters. The pride of life. I, I. That was what happened to Lucifer in heaven. He thought, well, I would like to have the position that God has. I want that position of glory and honor. So he turned and he possibly very well, he took those angels that are under him that were meant to worship God and he said, God has created me to be a beautiful being. I would like for you to bow down to me. Well, there's hierarchy in heaven. 
He was an archangel. He was over the lower angels. And they bowed down to him immediately. The pride that entered into his heart to desire something that did not belong to him. After Adam and Eve, and that is one of the great things that keeps us from coming to one us is our own pride. We don't want to heal ourselves. We don't want to die off to ourselves. We have our own way, our own way of doing, our own way of doing things and, and what we want. And nobody better stop me from what I want. And the world passes away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. He that doeth the will of God. We need to get on track with God. Separated from the world and separated unto God his will and his pleasure. It is at this point that many stop in their, their quest for holiness. <clears throat> Satan is offered and the flesh likes this. They choose to separate from the world, often doing so by not participating in many things the world would do. Movies, television, worldly dress, and all kinds of various activities. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, that brings God, whatever. And it may. Many of those things may, but their, their intent is, I'm going to do this so I can please God, rather than, and, and so they, they have their list. You can go into some holiness churches and some non-holiness churches, and they have their list of things. If you do this, you're a good Christian. If you don't do these things, you're a bad Christian. And so, instead of yielding to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit's guidance in their lives and the true transformation, they are adhering to a list and standards that somebody has given. So if I get my dress long enough, and if the guy is dressed conservative enough and, and covers his arms all the way down to his wrist or whatever, if I do these things, then I'll be pleasing to God. But they're doing it in the flesh. They can accomplish all those things in the flesh. But one thing we cannot do with our flesh and our carnal selves is we cannot transform ourselves into the very nature of Christ. And that's what is necessary. These people don't move into the reason why behind any of these, that's behind any of these acts of separation. They're getting the satisfaction by putting distance between themselves and the world, but are doing so without a heart change. If we are following the leadership of the Holy Spirit, many of these same acts of separation will happen anyway. The point here is that we are not trying to distance ourselves from the world. That is where our witness is going to be. How are the people out there who are unsaved, who are fallen, who, who need salvation, how are they going to hear if we cloister ourselves, lock ourselves away from the world? We can't be like those people. I've known people that would not attend the church. They didn't have anywhere else to go because it wasn't their type of, of people. You know, we, we've got to keep our, you know, our, our hearts pure. We don't want to mix with people. Well, and I, and I mentioned that once I said, but God wants you to take what you know into that place that's not right and show them how to live for Jesus. Be a witness there in a church. There's many churches out there that don't know how to live for Jesus. Well, if you don't have any place, any place to go, well, pray about which church you're supposed to go to and be a witness. And live your life off for Christ there. Didn't realize they were actually resisting the Spirit of God. They just stayed where they were. But if we distance ourselves from the worldly spirit that abides in most people, from the fallen selfish spirit that destroys life and relationships, and from the transgressions of sin, sins, and grieve people, some people go so far as to remove themselves from the church. I already said that. You are not having church by staying at home with your family. That's family devotions. It's family altar. I mean, for a time, maybe that's okay. But we're called on the larger body of Christ. It's much easier than joining other individuals and families that you've not learned how to get along with as well. You are in the church when you are with people different than you. But you're going to have to die to self in order to get along with them. 
You see that? God is going to call people into a body of believers. There's some rare cases in the earth where there is no other church and the only believers are the husband and wife and maybe one or two children. Maybe the only person that this in a village is, is one person and they may have to have church with the Holy Spirit, the two of them in a closed closet somewhere. Yes, it's out there. But if we have opportunity to be with other Christians, we need to take that opportunity and just die off to self. <clears throat> You are in the Church of Christ where the final solution is entire sanctification. If we can have church without denying self, or we can get along with our own group of people, then we're probably not in church. Because until we're entirely sanctified, we need help. And God will often use other people in our midst to challenge us in what we believe, and to expose our carnal hearts. So we find that we, I, this happened to me. Growing up, I thought I could get along with anybody. That's pride speaking. I was a good kid. I can get along with anybody. And then God brought along these people. They must have been really bad people because I couldn't get along with them. Oh, I was part of the bad crowd. Because in my own heart, I was still not operating on the fullness of God's love, and His long-suffering, His kindness, His weakness. You are in the Church of Christ, where the final solution is entire sanctification, completely <coughs> delivered from the stinking carnal nature, from the selfish fallenness within us that wants its way, causes strife and division and discontent, and hurts people. Now what does that mean? If you have a gathering of people and you have some discontentment, you have some strife. Uh, I didn't use that first, did I? Uh, does that mean, oh, we just got to go off by ourselves? Now, I do know of a church friend of mine, kind of a homeschool family's church he said Don it was horrible we couldn't get along we had such theological differences and it's because you know to save our children we become independent of those groups out there that are all wrong and they're not living for Christ we're living for Christ of course and we don't want to be a part of them and so oh well there's other homeschoolers or Christians we'll get together with them well the independent spirit is still so strong well, we realize, well, we don't agree on that. So, well, let's well, draw out. He said, that, that church, a bunch of families that Don it eventually evaporated. <clears throat> now, they did start another church and got with some people that are of the same heart and mind and were willing to die and learn to love one another, and they were able to do it. He got rid of that stinking pride that keeps us from fellowshipping with one another. So in 1 Corinthians 3, if there was strife and division among us, and we took the tack of many people, well, we can't worship with them because we can't get along with them. They believe a little different than we do. It's not a proper reason to leave. We've had people leave this church that belong here. I know they do. But they got upset about something. Couldn't handle it, and they left. It should have been here this morning. First Corinthians 3, I don't think I put it in there on my list here. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Let me see here. Um, I mean, the Corinthian church was said, you, you come behind and no gift, and you, you've got a lot going for you. But then here in chapter 3, he says, I, I couldn't speak unto you as a spiritual, but as a carnal, even as a debate in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able, for you're yet carnal. Whereas there's among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not 
final rock is men? But to point it out. At least they were still together. But he said, hold it. I want to tell you what's in your heart. So that you can get it right, so you can start loving one another, dying out to self and being cleansed. We have to do that. <coughs> God wants us to be entirely sanctified. So Paul says, the church doesn't like it. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That means completely. Sanctify means getting all that worldly stuff out, the selfishness, the pride, the free God, the whole spirit, soul, and body to preserve blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a great work. But that's where God wants us to get. <clears throat> when Claire Sams wrote in the Bible Methodist magazine a short list of describing holiness. Now I'm going to go over this, but we may touch upon some of these things in the future, but I want us to just see what they are. There's some basic things that, that we need to understand as part of holiness. Holiness, biblically and experientially, means a separation. We talked about that. Has included a spiritual cleansing. We're talking about that right now. The carnal heart needs to be cleansed and sanctified, purified, delivered, mortified, crucified. The language is strong, Paul uses. Has been referenced as a spiritual death coming to death. There's a wonderful evangelist who spoke to my brother in law, Robert Mori, and said, Robert, may the Lord slay you. You know what? What do we say to most people? Oh, but the Lord bless you. Maybe we need to be using something else. Help us along a little better. Uh, Dick and Norma, may the Lord slay you. <laughs> Why? Because you recognize that until there's a spiritual death and a cleansing and a true separation, we'll still be operating under some of the power of the world and selfishness in our lives. It's included a spiritual filling. Who's going to fill us? The Holy Spirit, who is holy, 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 part of the triune, holy, holy, holy God. He's going to be living within us. And why do we want to be living a uh, life of separation, cleansing unto death, is so that we will not grieve the Holy Spirit or willingly go into sin and despise the Spirit of God, as it says in Hebrew has been emphasized as a baptism. That God comes on us. There are, if we can get to a point recognizing our need for God, the deeper work, that we will just totally yield. Just open up everything and say, Lord, I give you absolutely everything. Reverend Helen told Jesus when he went to the altar, Lord, if I am going to the altar, I don't want to give you 90%, 95%, or 99%. I want to give you 100%. And I believe that was the key to his spiritual life. Most of us enter into our Christianity limping and still limping. It took away some of the limp. But we're still too involved in ourselves and it's got to go. It's been seen as an empowering. The Spirit fills us, baptizes us with his empowerment. And has been emphasized as perfect love. And the aspect that I want to talk about is this right here. Perfect love. <coughs> this, uh, one of the other articles in that magazine uh, talked about he was a bus boy. Doesn't mean that he worked at a restaurant busing tables. He was a bus boy. He and his sister were bus children. They were brought to the church on a bus. On a 1940s paneled man and because somebody cared enough in the church to go pick him up and get him there and through that time he was saved and he was recalling he said these people they love God and they worship God they would get excited about God he said there was a lot of excitement in that church the church happened to be uh, an old bar with various kind of buildings attached rooms attached and used for Sunday school classes and uh, they said the glory of God would be there. They loved Jesus and they praised Him and they knew how to worship and they knew how to live holy lives. And if somebody came in there, they knew how to love them. Somebody different, they knew how to love them. Perfect love. Perfect love for those uh, fellow believers in, that we associate with in our church here. 
perfect love toward the outcast and the stranger. This is what God wants. This gives us a good picture of the deep spiritual work that happens to us when we move into a life of holiness. And I want to focus on something more challenging and yet more glorious that comes out of this last one, this perfect love. Christ has called us to love one another. He said that he, we would be known by our love. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. It's got to be loved different than the way the world loves, because even the, the world will love itself and do things for one another. But Jesus said you love even when they persecute you. You love when they are taking your coat. You love when they slap you on the, on the cheek. When they make fun of you and they mock you. You love. You love. You give back love instead. And if we're not to that stage, it just tells us we need to be have that full deep transformation. <clears throat> but love is not easy, always easy with people whose background and upbringing is different than our own. And it is not that we don't love them on the outside, but there's missing the deep love and concern for one another that comes when we are no longer operating on a self level. When we are motivated by something other than our own self esteem and advancement and putting ourselves there. The word that best describes what I'm talking about is a loving relationship. And I'm, I'm going to try to stop here when we give it just a couple of illustrations. One from Reverend Helm. Somebody stood up in one of his meetings, was angry at Reverend Helm. And the Lord blocked Reverend Helm's ears from ears hearing. Ears ears. Couldn't hear what the man was saying, but he could tell he was, he was pretty hot saying all kinds of accusations against Brother Helm, and he was angry, and, and his countenance was angry, and of course the people kind of wanted to swing on, but Brother Helm said, oh brother, brother I love you, I don't know, I'm sorry I can't hear you, but I, I don't know what's going on, but brother I love you, and he meant it, he meant it, he loved him, that man as much as he loved his wife and his children than anyone else in the world, that's what transforming the power of Christ will do to us, we will love our enemies as our very own, Jesus said that. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I don't think any of us in this room are there yet. That's why we have to keep hearing this message. That's why we have to keep getting before God and Lord that little outburst that was not right with my companion, that that those words to my, my children, the way I came across, that cutting edge, Lord, take that out of me. Crucify it out of me. Cleanse it out of me. I don't want it. Let's get on Jesus' track and get with Him. If He doesn't want it, then we don't want it. And we need to start praying the way He would pray if He were us. <clears throat> so Reverend Helm just continue to, to pray. I don't know what happened, but while he was so angry against God's servant, the man had a heart attack and died right there. But all the way through, Reverend Helm is loving him. You've heard me say this before. Betty Robinson said, Lord, fill me so with honey that if I get squeezed, all that comes out is sweetness, is love. That guy wanted to, she was so angry at him. <coughs> and Betty Robinson was preaching. And the guy got so angry, he started hit him and then just jumped on his back and Betty Robin just kept preaching. Wasn't wasn't a change in, in his tone of voice and his his words. Wasn't a change in the guys beating him on the head out of a book or something. And he, he said, the guy said, Robinson, I'm angry at you. Said, oh, brother, I didn't know. Well, brother, I love you. Pure love. And until that transformation happens in our lives, we're not where the scriptures in Jesus Christ says He wants us to be living in this fallen world. Not there yet. 
That's why we continue to come back to it in our prayer time. We continue to pray, Jesus, help me be pure in heart. Deliver me from myself. Deliver me from the temptations around me. Help me to walk with you. Help me to be faithful to you. There's so many different ways we can pray, but it's all help me to be transformed into your very image, with your nature, with your character, with your love, with your long suffering, your forgiveness. It's on and on. The key element is going to be found in your relationships. It's going to be where you're going to know what you've got in your life. How you relate to people in your family, in the church, with your neighbors or workers, with your enemies that come to your gate and hate you, say things to you and about you. Try to destroy your reputation. It's in those relationships. Jesus said they'll know you because you have love one for another. They'll really know you when you have love for them. Yeah. Jesus, thank you for your word and your truth. Lord, help us as we begin to step into this, this understanding what true holiness is. He teaches and instructs us and help us, Lord, to be willing and desirous of being cleansed from everything in this world, everything in the self-life, the fallen nature will be gone, the old man cast out, putting on and be clothed with you, Lord Jesus. Not just having your righteousness placed on our account, but Lord, truly being transformed so that we are actually living righteous lives through your transforming power. So Lord, we, we lift, I lift all of us up to you, that you would work in our hearts, help us not shrink back from the call, but realize this is the this is where the fullness of our salvation is going to happen. This is where the joy unspeakable and full of glory and the uh, peace that passes understanding is going to happen in all of our lives praying for your grace upon us. May you help us today to love as you loved us and help us through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord.